microplastics. If you clicked on this video, you've probably heard of them, but what exactly are microplastics? Where are they? Are they in our food, in our water? What does that mean for our health? or the health of other ecosystems? And how can we prevent them from spreading further? Well, at the upcoming GSA Connects 2025 National Meeting in San Antonio, Texas, there will be a session dedicated to research on microplastics in the environment. And today I got to sit down with one of the scientists co-chairing this session to answer all of your microplastics questions. So let's jump into the conversation. Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Will Bailey. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin, Jackson School of Geosciences, working on my PhD in geological sciences, specifically microplastics in the Texas coast. Awesome. And today we're talking about the topical session that you are co-chairing at the upcoming GSA Connects 2025 meeting this October, which is titled Microplastics in the Environment. So just to start off our conversation, why did you decide to propose this session? Well, microplastics have been quite a hot topic lately and having the session in the state of Texas, San Antonio, it's a great avenue to showcase the great research that's coming out of the state and the country and then bring in experts from international groups here and collaborate with each other and work towards a solution with this global problem. What a great initiative. And yeah, it sounds like you're pretty close to where where GSA will be happening this year, which is super, super great. And yeah, it is just the best place to bring in all these international perspectives and collaborate on, on solutions and to big problems like this. And with that, like you mentioned, microplastics has been kind of a buzzword but what exactly are microplastics and why are we as geoscientists interested in them? Well, the term microplastic refers to particles, plastic particles that are less than five millimeters in size. There's a whole range of only of macro that's larger and then nano that's smaller than one micron. There's everywhere in the environments. There's been plenty of studies that shown that even in the most remote areas of the world, they are prevalent. And we as geoscientists are some of the best equipped with figuring out this problem because we can apply our understanding of natural processes such as sediment transport to figuring out where these particles are going and why they're concentrating in specific hotspots. That's such a great point. I think a lot of people would think of microplastics as being a an issue for biologists to study, you know, in the food chain and stuff, but it's so important that you know, we understand them before it gets to that, you know, in the sediment transport, in the, you know, environment, in the geological processes, like what are they doing? Where are they going? How are they getting transported? And how can we mitigate these effects? I mean, biology is almost kind of the, the after effect, like fixing the after effects of microplastics already being in the environment, but we kind of have to understand the whole context of it, the geology of it. So that's just so important. And so speaking of the geology of everything, how widespread are microplastics in the environment today? Are there places on Earth where there aren't any, or are they pretty much everywhere now? I think they're everywhere. There's been plenty of studies that have shown that they are in very surprising locations, such as the Antarctic ice sheets or the top of Mount Everest or the Rocky Mountains National Parks. Even where there's no people, the environment and ocean circulation can transport them very long distances. So I think you can pick an environment and you will find them. It just depends how much you find and, and then you can start to ask why. Yeah, I think you perfectly hit on the issue here and why geoscience is so important in studying this issue because it's not just where humans have been. It's where ocean circulation takes them. It's where atmospheric circulation takes them. It's where these geological processes are transporting them. Speaking of mechanisms that transport plastics, I used to think that plastics were kind of something just in, you know, solids or maybe water, but recently I learned that they can also be in the atmosphere. That seems crazy to me. What? So, so my question is, what are the biggest sources of microplastics and how are they moving through the air, water, and sediment? That's a big question. Um, but if you are aware right now, we're getting blasted by the Saharan dust cloud. So that's sand particles coming from Africa over the Atlantic and it's coming all the way into Austin. And so these sand particles are twice as dense as plastic in some cases. And so if we think about plastics, 
they can do that too, even easier. So you can walk down a road or highway and there's tire particles flying off every vehicle. Those are flying around and they can travel very large distances. So that's why we can see them on the tops of mountains, for instance. And then if they're not in the atmosphere, then they can be blown into streams or creeks and rivers, and then it's transported ultimately to the ocean. I'm looking at bays where there's a large drainage area of Texas that empties into this coastal environment, and we were looking for plastics down there. And we didn't find as much, and we linked that with storms transporting microplastics offshore, and that's ultimately where it goes, we think just long-term sinks of microplastics. Yeah, yeah. Just thinking about how many processes are affecting microplastic transport and just the global spread of microplastics is, is just insane. And this next question is a little bit more on the macro plastic side of things, but I know a lot of my viewers would kill me if I didn't ask, are there really huge islands of plastic floating around in the ocean or is that not the case like are those out there <laughs> yes they are definitely out there the great pacific garbage patch has received a lot of attention uh, we can see it from satellite it's yeah it's definitely the larger pieces that we can see from space they say it's twice the size of france or the size of texas depending which country you're in yeah there's islands of plastic in every ocean actually it's formed by the the ocean gyres where the currents converge and it collects all the floating debris. But what people aren't really talking about is that most of it, probably o over 90%, is the microplastics that we can't see. And it's floating up and down in the water column in that area. That's called the yo-yo effect, where the, the waves and the currents and the changing density of the particles causes it to go up and down in the water column. So we can see the large stuff from space, and it's quite a large surface area, but there's a lot more smaller debris in there that we can't see. Wow, I was really hoping you were going to say that was a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Oh, no. And I, I, that was my next question is, okay, that's where the macroplastic is. Where are the microplastics and all of that? And that is, that's crazy. So do they like go just bob up and down the water column? Is that how it works? Right. So most of the plastic will float, but when marine organisms start to grow on them or entangle them, they change density and they, they may sink for a given distance, maybe to the bottom, and they can be mixed with with waves and caused to go up and down yeah so do they i'm curious is part of the rock record already starting to you know are we seeing an increase in like microplastics or is it too soon to tell oh yes absolutely there's definitely a layer of plastics people have argued to have it a new geologic era called the anthropocene just based on all of the human debris that were dispersing in the environment such as coal or asphalt and concrete now there's new plastic rocks being formed called plastic glomerate. But yeah, there's there's definitely a layer down in the, in the in the ocean and wherever you look you can see a layer of plastic really. Wow, that is crazy. And I know there's still a lot of active research going on and this next question and a lot more to learn, but as of right now, how much do we know about the impacts of microplastics on ecosystems and human health? There's a lot of negative impacts on the ecosystems and human health. Uh, there was a new study that came out a couple of months ago that, that linked any coastal population that lived within 200 miles of plastic microplastics in the ocean were significantly at risk of cardiovascular issues. But we, we are really in the early stages I and mean, we can, it's tricky to study it with humans, but in the organisms, we can definitely see that there is an issue of them mistaking plastics for food and then they accumulate in the gut and they say that it's depressing, but they starve to death on full stomach just because the organisms can't process the plastic. And then now we're seeing that it's going into humans because we consume those organisms. And when it's nanoscale, it can penetrate tissues and cell barriers and enter the bloodstream and be transported through the entire human body. And we don't know how much we're really consuming and, and how much we're able to flush them out before they cause damage. I'm collaborating with some doctors here at the university, and they're looking at plaque buildup in human hearts and seeing if microplastics in the heart systematically accumulate more plaque and cause blockages. So obviously that would be a huge issue if there is microplastic buildup in human hearts. 
Uh, but it is in its early stages, I would say. And is there any research exploring how microplastics interact with other environmental stressors like heavy metals, pathogens, or climate change, you know, as a whole, all the impacts associated with that? Yes. We have some collaborators down in Corpus Christi Marine Science Institute, and they're really the chemists here. They're looking at microplastics, and they're studying how much they can act as a toxic sponge, it's considered. So these plastics are out in the environment, and they absorb all of these types of toxins, specifically mercury, and they accumulate that at much higher concentrations than normal sediment would, and then it's ingested into organisms and it biomagnifies up the trophic system, ultimately into humans. So that that's a problem of this toxic sponge effect. And then as far as climate change, I recently looked into the Antarctic ice sheets. And so these are connected to the ocean and the ocean is full of microplastics. And so the ice freezes the the microplastics and given rising ocean temperatures this ice is melting and then re-releasing you know billions of microplastics back into the environment and then there was another study that showed that the plastics on the surface of ice absorbs more solar radiation and thus causes the ice ice and snow to melt faster yeah <laughs> there's there's a lot of depressing information out there Oh my gosh, that is insane. I didn't even know about the albedo effect. That is not helpful considering we're already seeing that with just the ice melting itself, but that is just so far reaching into so many different like climate feedback mechanisms and food chain, you know, mechanisms and cycles. And oh my God, that's wild. Okay, all of that's pretty depressing, but moving to the slightly more positive section of this interview, let's talk mitigation strategies. What kinds of mitigation tra strategies are being explored? Are there efforts in place to increase cleanup prevention and policy around microplastics in the environment? Unfortunately, it is more depressing news. Uh, not really. More of the cleanup and mitigation is steered towards the macro stuff that we can see because that has been written into law and policy that that is an environmental contaminant and that needs to be prevented. But microplastics, microplastics haven't been written as, oh my God. Yeah. So that's, that's an issue that I've been, I've been trying to help specifically in Texas legislation uh, that they've been trying to pass a bill to make microplastic producers accountable for spill prevention and monitoring. And so we can't even get the key culprits to help be held accountable. There's no policy that says microplastics are a contaminant in the environment. So thus we can't, we can't get money to clean it up. There are some citizen scientists out there that are documenting where they exist, but there's, there's not a large scale operation for cleanup prevention of microplastics. I know there's, there's people that are trying to clean up the Great Pacific garbage patch, which is quite impressive. They use these huge nets and siphon it off the surface. But that's really just the big particles. Their mesh is much larger than any sort of microplastics. Yeah. How would we even, given this tiny size of microplastics, how would we even begin to clean that up, even if we did have the funding and support? There is a pretty cool study that's in its early stages in Germany. So they, they used the electrical charges of the tire particles to their advantage. And they put, they put this device inside of wheel wells to attract the tire particles as they're flying off the tire onto this device. So it prevents the rubber particles from being released onto the roads. And then they can also put these onto street cleaners. So that's that's some pretty cool technology, but really once it gets into the ocean or the rivers, it's much more difficult to clean up. It's really about figuring out how to capture it along its pipeline into the environment, such as looking at wastewater treatment facilities or, you know, much more proximal to their sources. Yeah, stopping it at the source, that would be hopefully what we can do. Um, but given their negative impacts, where do microplastics stack up on the ranking of environmental issues? Are they as urgent as the issues associated with climate change, habitat destruction, desertification, or other human impacts? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky question. I do think they stack up there, and it's, it's a much closer connection to humans. I mean, we directly caused these. We made them. We are the primary source, and they just they dispersed in the environment so quickly, you know, 
they've they're everywhere in less than 100 years and it's, it's yeah it's much more relatable than climate change which is documented in the geologic record for billions of years but these plastics are are human made so i i believe that we should be held accountable for that that's our problem yeah there's no getting around the cause of that one and there's no getting around the fact that they have negative impacts i hope soon we can put microplastics with macroplastics as an actual contaminant but in terms of tackling this issue we will always need more students in this field so what advice do you have for students who want to get into microplastics research what kind of skills or backgrounds would be most useful for this field yeah i like that question yeah, so when I started this, I just knew I wanted to do a, a graduate program here at, in Austin, and I said yes to whatever project it was, and it, it turned out to be microplastics, and so I said yes, and then what is a microplastic? So it's it, this area is, is kind of it's in its mature stage, I would say, as far as assessing it in the environment. There are established methods, not, not a systematic protocol, but there are methods out there to you know start from scratch. I think the key area is that you need to ask the right questions, not to just pick a place and count it. I think it's more about why it's there rather than how much. And you don't have to be a scientist. I mean, I work with doctors and lawyers and artists philosophers. I mean, everyone's out here trying to raise awareness and promote it in different ways to reach as many people as possible. I think it's just you need to ask the right questions and be able to convey the alarming information the most effective. But if you are a scientist that, you know, wants to count in an environment, I mean, it's it's a pretty straightforward process working in the lab. And it's a pretty great way to get into, you know, the scientific field of sedimentology or microplastics because you can, you can analyze this stuff um, in a pretty straightforward manner and then people are amazed by what you can find. What are some of the things you do in lab? So I'm looking at the plastics in sediments. So we, we float the plastic out of the sediments. So we add in a heavy liquid where the plastic would be less dense and so it would float while the sediment would be more dense and it would sink. So we, we float the plastic out and then we can filter it. We digest it with hydrogen peroxide to get rid of the organic material, which would be you know similar density to the plastic. And then we look at it under a microscope and we can count them. We can measure the sizes of plastics and classify them as different types. You can put it underneath a different microscope laser that can classify the different types of plastic polymers. And then you would also be looking at the characteristics of the sediment that it was in, you know, what kind of grain size it was or the organic content uh, as those have been, you know, believed to be proxies for microplastic concentration behavior, such as settling velocities and uh, different transport velocities. Yeah. Such important concepts for us to understand is like how these things are moving through the environment, where they're concentrating the most, why, and, you know, how we can find them and remove them. And so my last question is, what is the big takeaway you want people to leave with after this session that you're hosting at GSA? I'd say my main takeaway is we have an established plastic problem and we need to better address why it's in particular areas compared to others rather than just how much is where. It's more the question of why, what are the key controlling processes that are causing potential microplastic hotspots. And I believe knowing the why will better help us solve the problem of capturing it along the pipeline to where it's most concentrated. And so having an established that it is a problem, we can better, you know, put it into policy and law to help fix this problem. Absolutely. And no better way to establish these things than bringing in all the experts together to have very important conversations and talk about the data and talk about the findings and talk about the next steps. So thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing this. All the links will be down below for, you know, the session and stuff if you guys want to attend. I wish this wasn't such a depressing topic, but that's the reason we need to have these conversations and, you know, inform students, the public, everybody. This this needs to be out there and we hopefully can get microplastics in law as contaminants soon. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. This, you know, it was, it's depressing information, but it was a, it was a good conversation.